Welcome to day five of the Defiant Live. And today it's a very special day because we're doing the Metaverse 101. Any discussion about the Metaverse would not be complete without this. Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson. Its impact cannot be underestimated. And because this is the Defiant and we like to do things differently, I'm going to read to you now from this book. The lens can see half of the universe, the half that is above the computer, which includes most of Hero. In this way, you can generally keep track of where Hero is and what direction he's looking in. Down inside of the computer are three lasers, a red one, a green one, and a blue one. They are powerful enough to make a bright light, but not powerful enough to burn through the back of your eyeball and broil your brain, fry your frontals, laze your lobes. As everyone learned in elementary school, these three colors of light can be combined with different intensities to produce any color that Hero's eye is capable of seeing. In this way, a narrow beam of any color can be shot out of the innards of the computer up through that fisheye lens in any direction. Through the use of electronic mirrors inside the computer, this beam is made to sweep back and forth across the lenses of Hero's goggles in much the same way as the electron beam in a television paints the inner surface of the eponymous tube. The resulting image hangs in space in front of Hero's view of reality. By drawing a slightly different image in front of each eye, the image can be made three-dimensional. By changing the image 72 times a second, it can be made to move. By drawing the moving three-dimensional image at a resolution of 2,000 pixels on a side, it can be as sharp as an eye can perceive. And by pumping stereo digital sounds through the little earphones, the moving 3D pictures can have a perfectly realistic soundtrack. So Hero's not actually here at all. He's in a computer-generated universe that his computer is drawing onto his goggles and pumping into his earphones. In the lingo, this imaginary place is known as the metaverse. And that is the very first instance of the word metaverse in pop culture. And that is where our journey begins, because this is The Defiant. Don't let high gas costs keep you out of Ethereum. A balance of the gas-optimized vault architecture makes trading cheaper than anywhere else. Liquidity providers can optimize their fee earnings using the dynamic fee system that automatically adjusts to market conditions. You can also use asset managers to lend out idle assets, dramatically increasing your capital efficiency. And because Balancer is an open platform for flexible automated markets, you can choose from stable pools or weighted pools, and in the future more designs will be created that they don't even know about yet. Check it out at Balancer. Dot five. Ava, or is it Ava? I think it's Ava. Fun fact, that name is taken from the Finnish word for ghost, but there's nothing mysterious and weird about Ava. It is in fact a decentralized open source and non-custodial liquidity protocol on Ethereum. Depositors earn interest by providing liquidity to lending pools, while borrowers can obtain loans by tapping into these pools with variable and stable interest rate options. Deposit in Ava protocol and receive a tokens, which accrue interest every second right in your wallet. Seriously, you can watch your balance just going every second. Swap any of your deposited assets at any time to get the best yields on the market. And for the devs out there, Ava features access to DeFi building blocks like flash loans and credit delegation. Ava protocol liquidity pools are now available on Ethereum and the sidechain Polygon. So welcome to Metaverse 101, courtesy of the Defiant. And it is a strange day today because once again, China has banned crypto, but they cannot ban the Metaverse because the Metaverse is a bigger idea than any of that stuff. It's bigger than Bitcoin mining. It's bigger than liquidity mining. It's bigger than anything we have ever seen. And I'm excited to present this to you today because I think a lot of people have this idea about what they think the Metaverse is. They've probably gained exposure to it thanks to PFPs and buying land in Sandbox. But what I wanted to do with this presentation was encapsulate the best ideas that I found in the space and then give them to you in a way that hopefully gives you a filter for understanding what we mean by the metaverse and why at this moment in time, it's probably the most exciting thing that we have going for us. It is not just a meme. It is a real genuine movement that will change everything that we know. Very exciting. Let's jump into the presentation, Alpus Maximus. 
Metaverse 101, The Defiant. This image from Ready Player One, I guess encapsulates what people's idea of the metaverse is, a persistent game space that you enter via some VR goggles. It's completely surrounding you. It is a place where you can be whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. Is that really where we are? Well, yes and no. My thanks for this presentation go to Piers Kicks, who's the head of crypto at Bitcraft. <clears throat> Piers is also the metaverse consultant for Delphi Digital. He and I have had a conversation about the metaverse. He wrote an amazing essay about the metaverse. I couldn't have done this presentation without his work. Matthew Ball, VC of Epilon and Makers Fund. <clears throat> Matthew wrote what has basically become the tenets for what we believe the metaverse is going to be. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Eric Elliott, he's a JS developer, but he's also written some very, very clean articles about what the metaverse is. Those three people, go and find them on Twitter. They will give you so much great information uh, about what the metaverse is going to be and where it's going from all sorts of different perspectives, philosophical, technological, and just user-based. So those are some good uh, resources to go and have a look at. But why should we care about the metaverse? Well, I think there's this tendency when we sit in a blockchain space to believe that that is all that matters. Most people get into it through money. You want to make more money. Then we sort of fall down a rabbit hole of DeFi and changing the way that money works or NFTs and changing the way that culture works. That's all still locked to blockchain and cryptocurrencies. Where the metaverse is exciting is because there are a number of different really exciting technologies which are starting to reach a crescendo right now. I'm talking about cryptocurrencies, of course, but I'm also, also talking about gaming, Unreal Engine, just the most amazing, sick piece of software that you can download for free right now and get building games with real-time ray tracing, with millions and billions of polygons that just deliver almost photorealistic environments in the real time. Sick. VR, of course, AR. Go back and look at Jurassic Park. They are talking about VR, about modeling the genome in VR. It's ridiculous. But back in 1992, VR was a big deal. And then this went, oh dear. Now, VR is the real deal. Maybe it's AR, maybe it's VR, but some form of head-mounted display where you can view the world differently and receive information differently. Massive. And of course, AI. We know that AI is a big deal. We know that data crunching is a big deal. We know that the ability of AI is to simply solve problems that we cannot do ourselves. All of these things are converging and they converge spectacularly, beautifully in the metaverse. But at each point, we've been talking about technology. And the thing about the metaverse is yes, it's tech, it's built on, it's defined by, it's driven by tech, but fundamentally, the best version of the internet, the best version of that metaverse is human. It's you. You are at the center of it. And that is why we should be so excited about it. Also, this dude. Who's that? Lovely, handsome chap. Well, probably one of the most important people in tech of the last 20 years. Of course, Mark Zuckerberg, who has he said that Facebook is becoming a metaverse company. It's the biggest bet he has ever made is on Facebook becoming a metaverse company. And of course, instantly, as crypto natives, our hackles are up. We're believing, thinking that here is another example of Facebook just muscling in and taking over something, you know, on the grounds that they just have the power to do so. We will come back to Mark Zuckerberg because there is a tiny, tiny possibility that they are not, in fact, the evil empire that they have been for out, you know, the last five, six years. There's a chance. But we will come back to that. What Mark says is we will effectively transition from people seeing us as primarily being a social media company to being a metaverse company. They're in the middle of a massive transition. The uh, Oculus 2 is their big transition into having a hardware platform on which to deliver experiences for people through social. And of course, they have the audience. It's a big deal. That's why the metaverse is a big deal, because it unites big tech, crypto, AI, so many different technologies. And all of those attack vectors at the same time mean that there's going to be explosive growth 
in this space. That's why you should care. Look, Apple glasses. These are big rumors. We were talking to people last night about whether this is even possible, what they want to do. I mean, you get the feeling that if Apple put their mind and their money to doing something, that they will, and they'll make it work. They definitely have AR built into these pieces of technology that can do incredible things. Some of the things that we're planning on doing at the Defiant, we couldn't do it without the AR capabilities of an iPhone. Uh, how that translates to the future experience, I don't really know. We know that it's going to be clunky, but at the same time, you have to go through that transitional phase. It's like dial-up for all of, you know the old days of the internet. We have to go through that phase to get to the extraordinary capabilities on the other side. That's where we are right now. The thing is, all of this is happening, I think, far faster than anyone imagined. And I talked to some people this week about specifically the, the metaverse and what the visions of it could be. And they were like, yeah, it's in like three, four years time. It's going to be, yeah. I was like, no, 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 no. It's right now. And there's a few different reasons for that. But one of the biggest of all is this little chappy here, COVID-19. Because what COVID-19 has done is it's accelerated the impetuses and the, the trends that would probably accelerate the adoption of the metaverse. People working from home, co-working out the window. You are where you work, having to fend for yourself, having to work remotely. All of these things have accelerated the way the metaverse is being adopted. But also on top of that, there are things like, again, Unreal Engine and the way that that platform has suddenly become pretty much the backbone for everything that we can possibly imagine in a creative real-time context. That's big, very, very big. So where do we begin? This is my board ape. It's the board ape that I have in every show. And if you looked at what was going on earlier in the year, the big thing that people got excited about was that there was something happening between the board ape yacht club and the sandbox. What is the sandbox? Well, it's a quote unquote metaverse. It's a place where you build stuff, you make games, you have land that you can own and you can develop and you can do things on. And that's what got people really excited. And then we have things like Kong's VX, people designing and building experiences for the sandbox. That is what I think people think the metaverse is. But I think they're wrong. However, it does not remove the idea that the sandbox is probably the most exciting metaverse experience that there is currently going on. And if you were paying attention yesterday, you would have seen this. So that's a little glimpse of what the sandbox can do. And what was exciting was we had Snoop Dogg entering the sandbox. And that's what this looks like. Except it won't load because, you know, Google. <laughs> I love it. So Snoop Dogg is broken, but Snoop Dogg entered the sandbox yesterday and there's an entire Snoop experience with pimp cars and all these kind of things. It's dope. Uh, so there are many crypto metaverses out there. There is the Sandbox, there is Somnium, which is VR based. There's Decentraland, there's CryptoVoxels, and then Wild World, which is going to be built on Unreal Engine, which is very, very exciting indeed. The thing is, the way I perceive the metaverse now, it's not this. This is an instance of metaverse ideas and economies and everything else. But I don't see this as being the metaverse per se. And I think what I hope that you get out of this presentation is you start to think about the metaverse in a very different way, not as an experience, but as a layer, as a set of tools to view the world, to experience the world, to be active in the world. And the thing is, there is one constant throughout all of these worlds, and that is you. You are the most important thing in this world, not me, but you. And that is so alien a concept particularly when you think about you know, using platforms like Facebook and Twitter, you are not important. The platform is important. You are simply a mechanism for delivering content that helps the platform grow. 
Not at all in the metaverse. The metaverse, as we see it in its best form, is about you, special. And I've picked this image with a big glowing circle behind it because in my mind that represents your value, your worth, sitting behind you, thrusting you forward, making you important. But I can't see your face in this image because you're anonymous. You can be whatever you want to be. It's a very powerful idea. It's a very alien idea as well because governments, regulators, they want to know who we are and what we do and everything else. But constantly in crypto, we find ourselves looking for an alternative method and finding others who believe in that method as well to the extent that we can entirely transact and exist in ways that just seem increasingly alien to the IRL version of our lives. So this boils us down to the idea of the avatar. We've probably all seen the James Cameron film. Uh, you know, you go in, a, in the body of an alien and you pilot it and you are that creature in this alien world. Well, that, you know, is a sort of super stylized version of this concept. But the idea of the avatar goes back way, 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 way back in time to this guy, Richard Garriott. Who's Richard Garriott? Well, he was a game developer. He also went into space. Uh, he was the first medieval knight, supposedly, to go into space. It's important to look at how he's dressed because this idea of quests and adventures that is built into the games that he was designing, called Ultima 4, have weirdly come full circle and are now powering the kind of underpinnings of what the metaverse is. I know it's weird, but this guy, this nerd, I think we can call him that, is really important. So he says, Ultima 4 was the first game I wanted the player to respond to what I called moral dilemmas and ethical challenges as they personally would and not like an alter ego. And while doing my research on virtues and ethics to look for ethical parallels or moral philosophy, I came across the concept of the word avatar in a lot of Hindu texts. And in that case, the avatar was the physical manifestation of a god, of a god when it came down to earth. That's perfect because really I'm trying to test your spirit within my fictional realm. I mean, this is from a long time ago. I forget when this game came out, but it's like 80s maybe, late 80s. But that idea of being a god, a manifestation of a god when it comes down to earth, that is what avatar actually means. It's wild. We've just become so desensitized to what an avatar actually is, but this is the idea behind what an avatar actually is. So if we look at the word metaverse, because this is what every article about metaverses do. They break the word down, Greek, meta, beyond, universe, everything that exists, especially your physical matter. It's a portmanteau. You bash them together, you get metaverse. Awesome. You know, we have the Marvel cin Cinematic Universe, the universe encapsulating everything. Big, 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 awesome, awesome, beyond, bigger, metaverse. And it comes, of course, from this. That is Neil Stevenson. Note the swords. Here is another adventurer. This guy loves his swords. He loves adventuring, mythology, those kind of ancient pursuits. Weird. If we look at the metaverse in pop culture, on the left, Ready Player One, on the right, The Matrix. The metaverse as we understand it from pop culture is expansive. It is detailed. It is rich. It has the capacity to render photorealistic experiences which are simulations of the real world. And it feels like a game. But I feel that that image of the metaverse in pop culture is misleading. Filmmakers are visual. They need to tell you a visual story and they are incentivized by studios to paint a beautifully engaging visual story. But that isn't what the metaverse is. And I think it's problematic. Again, look at Fortnite or Second Life or Minecraft, visual candy absorbing, you get a dopamine hit when you play these things. Again, I don't think that's what the metaverse is. But it is helpful to think about games. <clears throat> so I wanted to dig into Fortnite because one of the most arresting things I saw in the last year was the Travis Scott concept. 12.3 million players. I'm going to say that again. 12.3 million, million players. You would be lucky to get 12.3 million people for an episode of America's Got Talent. You'd be lucky to get that. But here they were, they all converged on Fortnite. Piers Kick, so I referenced earlier, 
wrote about his experience there. And he said, the next 15 minutes represented one of the most intense digital experiences I've ever had. I don't say this lightly. And it was arguably the closest one can come to taking acid without actually taking acid. Players came into Fortnite. Travis Scott arrived in a spaceship and then he landed. And as Murat Pak says, the gaming industry is on the verge of swallowing the NFT scene entirely. Get ready. Gaming is coming for everything that we know. And it's going to be ridiculous. So let's have a take, a, take a little look at what happened during that concert. Play. Alp. Uh, yes. It's broken. Give it a second. Let's be patient. It's broken. Okay. Yeah, it's broken. I love it when the technology just doesn't work. Beautiful. Well, if this had worked, I would have shown you that concert and figured out that maybe we need to do a different way of doing this. That's a shame. There we go. See, when we did the tests on this, everything worked. And now we're doing the live show. Nothing works. Yeah, it's got it's to not work. It's got to not work. Well, we'll carry on regardless because that's what we do. But that's a shame because that is an amazing clip. I will try and paint the picture in words. Travis Scott comes out of the spaceship. He is about 50 foot tall. He lands and everybody there gets catapulted into the air. It's the most incredible thing. Go and check it out on uh, YouTube because it is genuinely incredible. I have a feeling that this means that all the subsequent clips that we want to do are not going to work out Gazimov. So I think what we should try and do is maybe reload the presentation and see if we can make it work because it would be a shame if we can't have video clips from Tim Sweeney and from Ryan Gill because that is what people want. Should we try one more time? Let's do it. So if I put it down to 360, uh, thanks, Google. Nope. So that's a fail on our part. And uh, we will just have to move to the next tab. So video gaming, what are the statistics? <clears throat> they are remarkable. As is my ability to clog up my own throat with phlegm. Yeah, you got a frog on your throat, <clears throat> man. It's not a king frog, subducks. So worldwide, there are an enormous number of gamers, 2.7 billion gamers worldwide. The global population is only 7.9 billion. That's a lot of gamers. That's like one in three people. And those gamers spend around $174.9 billion in 2020. However you look at it, that is extraordinary numbers. Fortnite's mobile microtransactions brought in over a billion dollars in two years um, using V-Bucks. And the, the overall market for video game digital items is $10 billion. Absolutely staggering numbers. Here's a quote from someone who saw the other side of this because those digital items that are in those games, they exist only in those games. So if Fortnite shuts down, for instance, every, all the value that's locked up uh, that people have acquired through that game, it disappears overnight. Now, we, you know, the narrative around NFTs and portability of value across um, ecosystems is, is well known now. But this particular human says, Blizzard removed the damage component from my beloved Warlock's Siphon Life spell. I cried myself to sleep. And on that day, I realized what horrors centralized services can bring. I feel for the lad. It was clearly something that meant something to him. He cried himself to sleep. Who was it? This guy, Vitalik Buterin, the person who has probably done more than anything else to promote the idea of decentralized <clears throat> value creation in blockchain and cryptocurrencies. So Vitalik was a World of Warcraft player. I'm going to come back to Ultima 4 because this game was basically text-based. If you, It says, Lord British says, Welcome, Mariah, and thy worthy adventurers. What would thou ask of me? People were playing this game, and it was a text-based adventure. But if you start to look at this, you look at Richard, you look at Neil, you look at Vitalik, and there's Dom Hoffman, and suddenly loot makes total sense. 
it is so strange to see how we've come full circle from Ultima 4 back to loot. But I think the most important thing here is that what happened over the last 20 years was the graphics cards got more and more impressive. People demanded more stuff. They demanded more experience. They demanded better sound quality, better visuals. But fundamentally, gameplay, the idea of gameplay and narrative and storytelling only needs words. It doesn't need all of that stuff. And it's the same thing with the metaverse. If we want to strip down and understand what the metaverse is, we've got to get rid of all of that fluff experience, all the hype, all the crazy visual stuff, and really drill down into the absolute essence of what a metaverse is. That brings me to Matthew Ball. Matthew Ball is a strategist, strategist, essayist, and investor. And he wrote a seminal piece about the metaverse back in January of this year. No, 2020, in fact. And he said the metaverse, what it is, where to find it, who will build it, and Fortnite, of course, and Fortnite. But in it, he articulated seven specific pillars of what he thought would make up the metaverse. And they've sort of become gospel for this entire space now. So the first of this was persistent. It never resets or pauses or ends. It just continues indefinitely. So imagine you play a game, you jump into the game, you start playing the game, you finish the game. When you come back to the game, it's reset. So everything was that you did is saved. You can have a saved game state, but it's essentially the game doesn't remember anything else in between where you finished playing it and where you started playing, picking it up again. If you go into Decentraland, CryptoVoxels or Somnium, those worlds just continue. You can drop into them whenever you want, but life goes on. That is persistent. So it's like real life. They just continue going. Synchronous and live. Even though pre-scheduled and self-contained events will happen just as they do in real life, the metaverse will be a living experience that exists consistently for everyone and in real time. So if I'm in Bombay, if I'm in El Salvador, if I'm in Buenos Aires, or if I'm in The Hague, it's the same experience. doesn't matter who you are, where you are. As crypto natives on the 24-7 weird-ass life cycle that we live in, I think we're kind of familiar with that. But for crypto muggles, the people out there that don't own Bitcoin or Ethereum, I pray for you. That is a weird idea. This digital existence just goes on. But it's a big one because there's a kind of bandwidth question there. Like how do you manage multiplayer at that scale? Big idea. There's no cap on concurrent users. So we can provide each user with an individual sense of presence. Everyone can be a part of the metaverse and participate in a specific event, place activity together at the same time and with individual agency. So that Travis Scott video that we couldn't watch, damn it, was a good example of that. It's a whole bunch of people, 12 million of them, 12 and a half million of them all coming together and the software didn't crash, Fortnite didn't break, they were basically killing each other to begin with and respawning and coming back because that's what Fortnite allows you to do. But they were all able to experience it in their own way, completely free. That word agency is very, very, very important. We'll come back to it. It has a fully functioning economy. Individuals and businesses will be able to create, own, invest, sell, and be rewarded for an incredibly wide range of work that produces value that is recognized by others. I would argue here, Incredibly wide doesn't go far enough. Limitless is probably the right word here. Limitless range of word that produces value that is recognized by others. And the thing about that value is we actually don't know what is valuable and what isn't. And there's a deep suspicion that everything is valuable, that the data we produce that we own is valuable. It's profound. It's a physical, digital, complete experience. So an experience that spans both the digital and physical worlds, private and public network experiences, and open and closed platforms. This is a big idea because traditionally what we think is Facebook bad, Google bad, crypto good, Bitcoin good, ETH. Uh, that's basically not going to fly anymore. Everything is good. Everything is on the table. Everything is valid. You can be an AI, AR citizen. You can be a VR citizen. You can be you know, spending most of your time in a gaming environment. It doesn't really matter. It all merges to the same thing. It's seamless. It's hard to imagine a time when 
one of these couldn't connect to the internet. And yet, that wasn't that long ago. Now we believe that the internet is a seamless mobile experience, but that's a relatively recent thing. Metaverse, same thing. Same thing. It will just bleed into everything. Talking to someone yesterday, they were talking about the next generation of screens being smart screens that cover your walls. So the technology will move from being this small device to being uh, something that you can see everywhere that might jump off your table. That's probably the next thing before we get on to kind of really, really, really smart glasses or chips or this kind of thing. But um, if you extrapolate forward, it's highly likely that implants will be how we interface with the world. And I do use the word interface, you know, appropriately because in the same way that gender boundaries are um, becoming mixed and we are starting to see more and more types of gender and identity, I suspect we're going to see the same thing with humans and technology merging, synthesizing, who knows. There is an optimistic view of this in which AI doesn't kill us all. That's where I sit. But that's because I have kids and I hope that the world isn't going to eat them up in some weird post-apocalyptic nightmare by the time I'm too old to do anything about it. Next, unprecedented interoperability. Big idea. We are starting to see this idea of interoperability take flight in the blockchain. For a long time, it would be in this kind of noble quest to connect up all the different chains. You know, it's the seven kingdoms of Westeros all working together. We're starting to see that now with um, considered blocks of blockchains working together. So Solana, Terra, Avalanche, who else? Harmony and Cosmos, that block of blockchains working together to interoperate and connect up all the different value propositions within those chains together. That's a big idea, but that's in the grand scheme of things, that's tiny. But what we want for a metaverse interoperability is the ability to take who we are and what we are anywhere we want without any friction. And that uh, seems like an easy idea, but it's, it's really not. Something like PDFs. PDFs are these incredibly versatile, simple document formats. But before PDFs, everything was a pain in the ass. I'll be, I'll be honest. So scale that up and, and think about 3D assets, a 3D file format that can travel between video games that is seamless. It's actually quite difficult to pull off, but there are advances in the way that I believe Epic Games is doing it. I believe that uh, NVIDIA has got a what they call the Omniverse. It's a file format that allows different um, file formats to travel between games. Pixar has one as well. It's the Universal Scene format, I think it is. F forgive me if I get that one wrong, but um, there's definitely moves towards making that happen. I had a great chat with Emma from Digitalix. That was the first thing she said. Like, If we want to create beautiful skins and custom skins of people for games, they need to be able to travel to any game you want. It's not there yet, but it will be before too long. The next pillow is it needs to be populated by content and experiences. This isn't that big of a stretch. I think we all understand just how influential the likes of Mr. Beast, Jake Paul, and of course me are in everybody's lives. Don't laugh. <laughs> Alps are laughing at me. I'm not that influential. I don't see clout, but today I will. But created and operated by an incredibly wide range of contributors, some of whom are independent individuals, while others might be informally organized groups or commercially focused enterprises or DAOs or whatever form of human clustering you decide that you want to engage in. And of course, if we extend that, you've got AIs and human synths. Oh my gosh, there's so many, so many different ways that human beings can cluster together and different ways that they can cluster together. But fundamentally, experiences and content are how we want to enjoy the world. And I do say that deliberately because there is this weird mindset change happening right now. And I don't know if you can feel it, where the world is becoming more ludic, society is becoming more ludic. And by ludic, I mean, we play games. It's becoming more gamified. Some of it that is good and some of it is bad. But if you look at pygmy tribes, for instance, in the Amazon rainforest, their whole society is built around playing games. Mm -hmm. I know it sounds weird, but scientists have studied these communities and, and come to the conclusion that their well-being, their, their health is enhanced by being ludic societies. 
And I feel like the metaverse is starting to kind of re-trigger that idea. Now, of course, it's all video games and everything else, but and who knows how wholesome that is, but it's definitely something that's at the back of my mind that we are returning to a state of ludic society and temporary game playing, but that becomes work. And that is kind of cool. So I'm going to come back to Piers Kicks and a definition that he put together of the metaverse based on those seven principles. So his definition of the metaverse is a persistent, live, digital universe that affords individuals a sense of agency, social presence, and shared spatial awareness, along with the ability to participate in an extensive virtual economy with profound societal impact. Now, there's a lot packed in there. This idea of agency. I have made many films in my lifetime. And when you're writing a screenplay, one of the first things you have to do is instill a sense of agency in your lead character. And that means that this character has the ability to change the world around them. They have the ability to determine their own destiny. It means you have the power to act. So much of what happens in crypto removes that from you. So today, the market was bleeding. It was heavily red. You had no control over that. That was done completely outside of your, your sphere of influence. But what the metaverse is about is returning power to you so that whatever you want to do and however you want to do it is within your grasp. Now, there are some huge legal questions over that and there's some huge ethical questions over that. But fundamentally, that's where it starts. The, the ability to be the master of your own destiny. Shared spatial awareness. Well, yeah, if you could see that Travis Scott concert, it would make sense, but we couldn't, so we can't. And then the virtual economy, I think everyone that's familiar with this space will understand the power of that. And then profound societal impact. I don't think I'm going to be able to show you the Tim Sweeney clip from later, but Tim Sweeney, who's the chief bod at Epic Games, this is where that's come from. And this is one of the, you know, the most successful companies in the world right now, talking about societal impact. This is going to be a big deal. So I'm going to go through a couple of tortured metaphors right now. And the first one is this idea of density and of compact people coming together in a city. And so I guess for me, with Web2, you have these incredibly densely packed verticals like Facebook, like Twitter, where people like you and me go there, we find a home for ourselves, and then we start to bed ourselves in with everybody else that's packed in there at the same time. And it feels very much like a dense cityscape. Everything builds vertically. We build vertically on Facebook. We build the biggest skyscraper we can on Facebook. But Web3 doesn't do that. Web3 builds horizontally. So it's actually much more about spreading out, about going as far as you can. And I've put that image of the skier on that 120 foot cliff because that's an expression of pure freedom. No one said, go and jump off a 120 foot cliff, but that skier spent hours and hours and hours scoping out that cliff and deciding that that was a safe place for him to jump off, knowing the skills that he had. That for me is what the metaverse is about. It's about trusting ourselves and our skills to go and do something because we can, and because we are empowered to do so. Naval Ravikan wrote a, a lovely tweet where he, he talked about Bitcoin is an exit from the Fed. DeFi is an exit from Wall Street. Social media is an exit from mass media. Homeschooling is an exit from industrial education. Remote work is an exit from nine to five. Creator economy is an exit from employment. Individuals are leaving institutions. COVID has accelerated all of this. But fundamentally, the thing is, we have been brainwashed into believing that the value is a place that we go to. Work is a place that we go to. But Web3 and the metaverse completely flips that on its head. What it says is the value is where you are. Working remotely, the value has to be where we are. And suddenly there's this rewiring of everything that we believed was important, that we had to go and work in the big city because that's where the work was. And if we didn't do that, then we were subclass citizens. No, 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 no. The value is where you are. And it's very important to hold on to that because suddenly you go, yeah, I am special. And then everyone thinks, oh, you, 
beautiful snowflake you. But no, that is where the value is. You are, in fact, the center of your own universe. That's just not how we've been accustomed to think for the last 30 years, more, 50 years. It's been about corporate expansion, about going and working for an engine that empowers you and lifts you up. But no, not anymore. Not in this space and not in this way. But in this metaverse concept, you are the center of your own universe always. Always. It's persistent. So and who you are matters. Three avatars here. On the left, Banteg. In the middle, Danny. If you don't know who Danny is, this is the number one ranked crypto punk, Danny. And then on the right, that's me. I've only recently adopted this avatar as me, but increasingly I'm becoming aware that this is in fact my identity and this is how people will see me in the world, online, in virtual environments. And of course I have a physical presence here and you know who I am, but this character and what it represents the community I'm in means something. Banteg, hugely influential. When you see that, you know it's Banteg and you know what he represents. And that's a big deal. Your appearance now is what we call residual self-image. Nothing is working, Alp. Of course. So it is ironic that the um, Your the technology in which we call residual Thank self you. Thank you, Google Slides. Residual self-image. Residual what... self-image. So the clip from The Matrix is where Ma Neo is being kind of confronted with the idea that his identity and who he is is a memory and it's simply constructed in this virtual environment i do see that that idea of identity is going to be a big 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 deal and so i'm following the likes of artifact the fabricant and digitalix who are all doing different versions of this artifact is doing a drop called akira and it's going to be an anime flavored um, pfp project you'll be able to express yourself as this character but they're building an entire world an entire universe around that that is going to be deeply immersive and very exciting to see. And again, Unreal Engine. The Fabricant is more like digital haute couture, but it's this ability to express yourself flamboyantly or through fabrics and textures that you wouldn't be able to otherwise. And Digitalix, the digital fashion engine, they're more kind of um, on uh, game skins and that kind of thing. But this idea of who you are and what you wear digitally is going to grow immensely because your identity will become the way that you interact with the world. Who you are visually is going to be how people know you. And the rest doesn't matter anymore. You know, if you think about how your identity is normally carved out, it's your social security number, it's your bank account, it's your credit score, all of these things. Online in this world, no. What you have done actually matters. And I've referenced Damien Hurst, the currency here, because when this sale actually happened, the weirdest thing, there were some rules and selection criteria. So there were buckets of applicants that they that you might fall into. And the buckets included NFT power users, DeFi users, Henny customers. And if you were an NFT power user or a DeFi native user, it would classify you uh, if you held a CryptoPunk or a Hashmask or a MeBit or a Border Yacht Club or an Artblocks NFT. And then we classified DeFi native users as users that have interacted with Uniswap, Metaswap, SushiSwap, Compound, Ava, and MakerDAO. And so you would be an NFT power user or a DeFi native user. So your history, as referenced by your blockchain activity, qualified you for a drop. Never seen anything like that before. And of course, you know, if you used Uniswap before a certain amount of time, you would have, got, you would have gotten the Uniswap token drop. This is entirely connected to your Ethereum wallet, which is just the weirdest thing. And that brings me to my second highly tortured metaphor. Problem we have in this space is that there's, we just don't have the language to describe the stuff that we want to describe. It's not possible. And so we have to use these very labored and awkward metaphors. But the, the metaphor I wanted to use was of a car. I see DeFi as being the engine of the car. It is how you power everything because it's financial. You need money to make the wheels go round. It is the lubricant for activity in this space. We're very accustomed to having lots of kind of liquidity sloshing around in the cryptocurrency space, but that isn't necessarily the case in other parts of the world um, where they, it's much harder to spin up 
liquidity and, and gain access to finance. But DeFi is that engine. It is the beating heart of all of this. Then you have NFTs, which for me represent the bodywork. So they're the beautiful exterior. They're the social signaling. They are the external presence of all of that power and beating heart. And then you have the metaverse, which for me is the map. Go explore. Take whatever route you want. Go wherever you want to go. You are free to go and explore wherever you want to go. And of course, in the middle of it all is the driver, and that is you. And that's how I see the metaverse and its connection to what NFTs. What is real? What is real? Indeed, Morpheus, what is real? Well, I'll tell you what isn't real. The ability of Google Slides <laughs> to play a video in real time in a live stream. So bored of that. So I want to take this back to this time cover, which I believe is 1992, when we were talking about the metaverse as experienced by Hero, the hero, ironically enough, of Snow Crash, talks about the lasers beaming the world into his eyeballs. And we have that idea here. The information superhighway was the meme of all memes when it came to the internet. But we've moved beyond that. When we talk about the metaverse, what I think we're talking about is a value superhighway. And so for me, the metaverse is a kind of misleading name because it implies a place. It implies geography that you can go and reside in. Whereas for me, the metaverse in its purest form is, is not that. It's a layer through which to see the world. It's a layer in which value can be transacted and transmitted, in which identity can flow seamlessly from one place to another as much as it wants and as quickly as it wants, or you know, set up shop somewhere. So when we talk about metaverses like Sandbox, like Somnium, again, misleading, because they are instances of experience that are built on the metaverse. They're not the metaverse themselves. And I think that is incredibly important to separate out. There is the experience, there's all the fluff, there's all the, you know, the excitement and all the eye candy and all this stuff, but it's not actually what the metaverse is. It's a, it's a layer, not a place. Your ETH wallet, your ability to transact peer-to-peer -peer seamlessly. I wish I could play this clip because this is um, Jack Mallers who did a demo of tipping Bitcoin to someone in El Salvador. It, it went heavily viral this uh, today or the, the last 24 hours. But it just demonstrated how profound coupling a social network with a payment network in this way was. Now, of course, Bitcoin and sending Bitcoin is, you know, it's a little expensive, but it does demonstrate the point that we don't need the likes of Western Union. We don't need centralized industries. We need a functioning economy and an economic system that can transact freely without borders. And you just start to think about all the friction points that we have. You just go, why can't I, why can't I not send money to somebody? I can send an email. Why can't I send money? Such deep, deep questions being, being asked here. Go on, play. Yo, we're here in Chicago. No, no chance. <laughs> Alp, you're fired. <laughs> so um, I think that there's, the, well, basically, I think what we'll probably try and do is. Um, Someone commented saying that if we have a YouTube premium, we can download the videos and then oh, embed no. videos that way. Oh, it's playing now. I have the, and we've got I have the videos on, I have the videos on Google Drive. And um, I think what might be possible is to play them directly from Google Drive. So once I finish the presentation, we can we can jump into some questions and I can show at least some of those clips because uh, particularly Ryan, Tim Sweeney, super important. But let's let's move on. So the most important question of all when it comes to the metaverse, can we keep it open? We've talked about Facebook. We've talked about Google. We're actually suffering with Google right now. One of the dirtiest secrets in all of crypto and it's not even a secret, but when you think about Bitcoin, about nodes, or you think about validators on proof of stake networks, where do you think the software is running? Because I guarantee you, the vast majority of it is running on AWS servers in the cloud, 
is that decentralized? No, it's not. So there is a problem that we have to solve, which is if we want to be genuinely properly decentralized, we have to decouple from the big technology companies. But the big technology, big technology companies are not stupid. They understand this space far better than we give them credit for. And I don't think they are necessarily threatened by it. I think they might see an opportunity here. Here's Zook. I went through the article with The Verge, and there were some interesting things here. I'm going to call out this quote here. He says, I guess one broader point that I'd make here is, one lesson I've taken from running Facebook over the last five years is that I used to think about our job as building products that people love to use. So old school. But you know, now I think we just need to have a more holistic view of this. It's not enough just to build something that people like to use. It has to create opportunity and broadly be a positive thing for society in terms of economic opportunity, in terms of being something that socially everyone can participate in. It can be con inclusive. So we're really designing the work that we're doing in the space with those principles from the ground up. This isn't just a product we're building. It needs to be an ecosystem. So the creators who we work with, the developers, they all need to be able to not only sustain themselves, but hire a lot of folks. Doesn't that sound an awful lot like what a CEO of a blockchain company would say, or a decentralized CEO, whatever you want to call it? This idea of everyone being able to participate, inclusiveness. But this is Mark Zuckerberg. The whole business model of Facebook has been around data, about mining data, about exploiting data on servers. And yet he's talking like this. Is he woke? Has he figured out that that's where we need to go? Or is he simply painting the right picture and that there will be some backdoor in whatever product they decide to put out there that will allow them to continue exploiting data and exploiting people and simply leverage their advantage in terms of user base? to put through whatever it is that they want to put through. However you look at it, there is no doubt that Facebook's attempt to put a stable coin on the market was single-handedly responsible for putting more heat on crypto in the eyes of the regulars that happened in the last few years. That's Facebook. That's the power of Facebook. Tim Sweeney is a very interesting character. I've never seen anyone who's so awkward on camera before who's the boss of such a massive company who's gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with Bill Gates. His view is kind of interesting. He says the open metaverse requires companies to have enlightened self-interest. Again, when we think about blockchain and the game theory that sits behind the way consensus mechanisms work, everything is about self-interest. I don't give a shit about anybody else. I just want what's right for me. However, the system is engineered to make what's right for me right for everyone. And so we have mutual self-interest. Our interests are aligned. That's what Tim Sweeney's talking about here. He's basically saying, you know what? If we think open, Apple, Sony, Google, Facebook, all the big boys, if we think open, then we all stand to gain immensely from that process. He's been in battle with uh, Apple of late, because they were fighting back against the 30% fee that was due to Apple on in-app purchases. So there was a mechanism by which you would go and do purchases from within the iOS app on Fortnite um, in the Fortnite store, and Apple got nothing. And that was a big shitstorm. And now Apple's gone, uh, you can't do that, you can't do that. And Tim Sweeney's gone, uh, fuck you, basically, and bless him. He's actually starting to get somewhere. There is an amazing video clip that we have of Tim talking about how he managed to persuade um, Microsoft and Sony to, to take on Fortnite and make it an open you know, game that, that played across multiple platforms. Apple refuses to play that game. And you have to ask yourself, why? What are they so afraid of? Apple is a walled garden, and it's been a very successful model for them for the last God knows how long but the world is changing. And it is my fervent belief that Unreal Engine is the platform upon which pretty much most of what we will experience will be built on. It is incredible. It's also free. Um, so yeah, I'm really curious about where Tim Sweeney's going with this. We won't be able to play the video. Well, I think we have to start from principles, right? So we're gonna jump ahead past that, but it is a fascinating piece of content. Um, 
more so just for seeing this this really kind of endearing CEO of a massive company talk the way we do. And I think we have to kind of park our prejudices about mainstream companies and big tech companies that they don't get this and that we don't Most think of the do. industry because they really, really do. They actually genuinely do. I was hoping to have a clip from Ryan Gill, who's the CEO of Crucible on the show. Um, Ryan actually came up with the idea of the open metaverse. It was it originated with him. And he's been working with some of these big tech companies like Unreal to promote that idea. And the only way that it really works is like this. You need connective tissue. You need to be able to put a decentralized layer, a blockchain layer on top of an existing user base or an existing game base like Fortnite. Once you can do that and you can bridge those two worlds, then the, it really, the world really is your oyster because why would there be any resistance to that? It just makes sense. Someone was asking me yesterday whether they thought, whether I thought games were, you know, were a, a decent place for blockchain to insert itself. I was like, it's a no brainer. Everything we do is a game. It feels like a game. The people who play these games are accustomed to paying for digital items. If you just level up that experience and you make it portable across different games, like everybody wins. It's a no brainer. So I won't have that clip, unfortunately. So Ryan, Ryan. it's a very, very simple question. Can you explain to me what? Well, he can't because Google won't let him. The spinning wheel of death. So now I'm going to um, put ourselves out to the questions. Al, have you been have you been squatting on the the questions there? Yeah, we have a question from uh, Dennis. Dennis asks. Yesterday, I saw a tweet about how corporations overtook Web 1 and made it Web 2. Can that be the case for Web 4? Well, Web 4? When did we, when did we, get, when did we get past Web 3? Uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know. Um, the thing about Web 3 is that it's, it's very, very early days. I think it's... It's almost wrong to call it something like Web3 is an evolution of stuff that happened with Web2. Um, we call it the Internet of Value, um, self-sovereign identity, uh, innate value that you create and you owning that value. I mean, that's such a profound idea and such a big idea. But how it manifests itself, I don't know. And I suspect that the killer application of all of this, the thing that makes it all live and, and breathe and get excited and adopted doesn't exist yet and we won't even know what it is for like 10 years but maybe it'll happen quicker than that you know what i what i'm excited by is the fact that it's happening so fast so we get to see it happen and and roll out in real time and i i think about you know pfp avatars that can exist by themselves and have ai built into them that can can house content and be experiential and you can go and walk up and talk to them. There's a whole bunch of stuff that we're just kind of exploring and, and that that is very exciting and unusual and weird. But I, I, I feel like the best version of all of this is going to be these major companies that have understood the power of the audiences they connect with, reaching out and bridging over to what we do. And I, that's why I put those clips of Tim Sweeney and and Mark Zuckerberg in there because there's a kind of I have a feeling that they're moving in the right direction. Maybe I'm giving them too much credit, but it just feels like there's something good happening there. You know? Next question. More questions. Yeah. ETH Famous asks, what are any potential dangers, negatives of having a metaverse? Can you can you own a metaverse? Is that is that a thing? Uh, no, well, the whole idea, yes, of course you can own a metaverse. Because, I mean, uh, if, if we want to talk about quote unquote metaverses like Sandbox or Decentraland, the idea is that they are not owned by a single entity. But of course, a single entity trumped them up and created them. There's obviously, you know, people think of Fortnite as a metaverse, Roblox as a metaverse. If someone pulled the plug on Fortnite, yes, it goes down. Those are instances of metaverse-like experiences. But again, we the purest form of the metaverse is like a loot NFT. It doesn't have any flim-flam on top. It's just these fundamental pillars that exist 
like interoperability, content creation, functioning economies, these kind of things. So that you shouldn't be able to take down. And that's why blockchain is so important because it is this decentralized thing that we can use to make this open metaverse actually happen, actually a reality. That's a big deal. Okay, next question. Do you guys believe this will happen on the blockchain? It, it already is happening, right? Tell me where else an open uh, metaverse can happen. We have another angle. Look at that. What's up? So we get, uh, you, you can't do, you can't do a, um, an open metaverse without the blockchain. I don't think there isn't a, a, another technology that would allow it to happen. At least not the way we want it to happen. I don't think. Next question. How do you see the metaverse affecting someone with little interest in gaming or social interaction? With a lack of free time, I struggle to see how it warrants the investment at present. Uh, so that's basically a what's in it for me question, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I get that. I do. Uh, I think there's... Th that's basically the reason I wanted to do this presentation, which was when you think of it as a game and you don't play games, then it's very hard to see what's in it for you. If you think of it as a layer that sits on top of your ordinary everyday lives that asks you a question about your interactions with everything, basically, you know, is, is your relationship with money the way it could be? Is your relationship with the value you create the way it could be? And for most people, I suspect the answer is probably no. And I think that's really the best bit about the metaverse. It will, it will fundamentally challenge all the assumptions we have about everything um, and force us to, to think in a healthier way about a lot of the relationships we have with technology, with, with work in particular, and with content creation. And it will revalidate a bunch of things. I don't know necessarily whether everybody's going to jump on this and be an early adopter, but it's inevitably going to leach into everything. Here's an interesting question. Um, what are your thoughts on the issue of certain groups, fractions taking hold of the large amounts of digital property on various platforms? So that's a valid question. There's rent seeking. Yeah, for sure. In, um, in these digital worlds, I, Myself, I, I purchased a bunch of land in Somnium because I was really intrigued about the possibilities of Somnium. And I know lots of people who have bought vast amounts of land in the sandbox. And it's speculative, you know, the, it's like an, an, a digital gold rush, this kind of thing. I think it's problematic. Yeah, 100%. Um, if the purpose of those pieces of land is simply to make money for those who own them, then we're just perpetuating the same uh problem that we had previously um what i hope would happen is that the people who have the most need for it would understand that all of these um worlds and everything else all the code is open source so you can fork it off and make your own one i wouldn't necessarily recommend doing that necessarily because it's a lot of work but um it's one of the thing about open source if it something doesn't work for you fork it make your own version and then make something that does work for you because then, you know, you have full control over what it is that you want to do. And then hopefully you can incentivize and persuade people that that's something that they would want to do. And, you know, you can align on mission and philosophy and all these other things. So that's pretty much the only solution to that, but it is at least a solution. Okay, Arya asks, what advice do you have toward the blockchain gaming startup looking to be a fundamental component of the of the metaverse? Uh, I would say stop thinking of yourself as a fundamental component of the metaverse because that's such a thing doesn't doesn't really exist. The metaverse is an opportunity. It's a it's a structure that you can employ take advantage of. It's not a place. That's what I have to keep saying. The metaverse is not a place. It's it's a set of tools that allow value to, to, to pass freely from one place to another. 
the easiest way to think about it is your ETH wallet allows you to access DeFi services. It allows you to access so many different things without you having to log in. It just, it is what it is. It travels everywhere. And that's the really the most basic version of it. We are seeing, you know, a text-based adventure play out in DeFi. The UX element that we're so accustomed to isn't there yet, but that's what I think a metaverse should be. Make, if you want to be a great blockchain game, just take the word blockchain out of it. Just be a great game. Like blockchain is there. It's quite well established now. All the economy elements that we have are pretty well established. Just make a great game. The rest of it will take care of itself. And if the audience that you want to reach is on the blockchain and you involve them in the process and you allow them to be stakeholders in the process, it'll take care of itself. The The power of the crowd to arrive at the right decision and achieve consensus and stuff is, is one of the most impressive things about blockchain. Brad Sharp asks, I struggle to see how the metaverse can work beyond just skins, properties, need to be interpreted to make any item useful, and that needs someone to implement it. Yeah, interpretation is, is correct. However, you know, we have we have these things. You know, we can take raw data and turn it into WhatsApp messages or tweets. All those things. I think that's kind of a given. It's probably the again. I come back to these these pop culture references where we've seen these massive, immersive worlds and environments as the metaverse. And yeah, that is actually already possible. If you go in Somnium and you walk around there, that's kind of what it feels like. It is actually the experience you have. But you know, fundamentally, the metaverse itself is not a huge leap from where we are now. We very accustomed to sending information everywhere for accessing Netflix, whatever entertainment we want everywhere. The metaverse simply adds a layer of ownership on top of that, that allows you to transact value between people freely. What's going to get built on top of that and how that's going to be leveraged for people? I don't know. But when I talk about you being the center of your own universe, that's what I mean. You know, you carry all of this stuff with you. So if you decide you want to go over there, then all of that comes with you. That's the bit that's hard for people to understand. It's like you, your entire house, your entire possessions, they come with you and they have value wherever you go. That is alien and that is weird. And that is an, that's an idea that, that people need to understand. But the technology for it already exists. If I, if I go into OpenSea, it reads my NFTs. If I go into Rarible, it reads my NFTs. So my collected history and my collected wealth or value or whatever it is comes with me and it's there and present and accessible in exactly the same way, whatever platform I go to, whatever interface I use, and it is entirely mine. That's weird, but it's where we are. And that's really what the metaverse will allow us to do is to, to leverage that portability. And, and, and then of course, you know, you put skins on top and you build up all the kind of visual elements and that's, that's a UX thing, but yeah, it, it's so much more than just a game. So Emre has a question. He asks, can we see Star Atlas as one of the best sample games for Metaverse in future? And Star Atlas is this NFT project we covered last week, I believe, right? Or what was it, that? Yeah, it is. It's it's very exciting. I know Ryan uh, has such a, such a pain. Ryan had such, such good things to say about what they're doing with Crucible. But yeah, Star Atlas is a very exciting game. It looks beautiful. You know, the you go on the webpage and it's it's like the titles of star trek discovery it's a beautiful aesthetic and it's going to be built on unreal it's going to be highly immersive i mean i personally don't have time to play games like that because i'm too busy making this stuff but if i can give you a glimpse of where we're going with the defiant that kind of immersive gameplay environment is i think what we would like to try and do with the content that we make and the weird thing is that it's that sounds like a, an idiotic thing to say, but it actually isn't. Because if, for instance, this camera that's filming me now was a virtual camera and this backdrop we'd actually built in Unreal, but that camera was, you know, was a VR controller, then 
all that's required of me is for me to be a virtual character and an Akira from Artifact or a Fluff or a Mebit is a valid character for me to be. So this, those worlds feel completely disconnected, but if we're building stuff in Unreal and we're building blockchain powered virtual production game worlds, why can't those talk to Star Atlas? And why can't you know a piece of what we do exist in the Star Atlas universe? That's that's where stuff gets really interesting. Um, so I think, yeah, Star Atlas is very, very exciting. Um, I'm very keen to dig in further and see what they're up to. Parallel Alpha is another one I'm really curious about. Interstanding asks, Facebook just dumped 10 billion into Metaverse implementations. What do you think that will look like? <clears throat> I think it will look like something that makes sense for regulators. Um, if you're Facebook, you are under the gun from the US government in terms of regulation, in terms of your standing for everything. I think the reason that they spent so much money on it is because, well, because they have to. They have to make it secure and safe and present the right face for uh, regulators who are deeply troubled by the influence that Facebook has on our digital lives. The, the kind of the obvious route for Facebook seems to be the Oculus. So we, we have three Oculuses at the office. Um, I, you ask the guys, I go in, I do VR boxing every day, like three times a day. I just go and beat the crap out of someone that doesn't exist. Um, that platform is their way of challenging the iPhone. Obviously, it's a hardware play. If you talk, if you see what Zook is saying, um, he ad admits that the experience of um, VR is is clunky. He, if I recall correctly, in the article he says we're accustomed to looking at things and saying big is better, but what he lands on is the idea that shrinking things down is going to be the way forward and making things um, trigger when you're near them, making them lightweight, it's probably going to be the way forward. And obviously the, the, the VR goggles are not that. And I don't think any of us really know quite what the Apple glasses will look like, what smart glasses will look like. Inevitably, it's going to be super clunky. Like version one of the iPod was, was a clunky thing, but without that, we wouldn't have an iPhone. Um, so I think it's, it's the visual element of it. It's the it's how people are going to interact with each other safely. But you can already see with so many things that they're doing that they're they're kind of gearing up for a for a big assault on this. I just when he says holistic, I'm not entirely sure what he means there because he could just be playing to the crowd. Um, Facebook has proven themselves um, to be the company that that acts first and says sorry later. Uh, you know, so uh, I I don't have the the foresight to really understand what it is they're actually up to and whether they really mean it. But I was surprised by the language that he used and how close it was to the to the sentiments of what we do every day in this space. Okay, another question from uh, Emre. He asks, I believe five G connection speed will be crucial to have this metaverse experience with Google's on. Uh, what do you think? Yes, you are correct. Next yeah. question. <laughs> uh, so, someone's talking about the Alter Ego music competition game show produced by Fox. Yes. If you saw that, it's people, they go on stage, they have uh, virtual characters, they have iPhones in front of their faces like that, they're wearing mocap suits, and they move around, and then on stage, they are virtual characters. If you've seen Code Miko or Corey Strasberger, who has a character called Blue uh, on his YouTube channel, Xanadu, this stuff is sick. I will reveal now live what we have planned for the Defiant because you guys deserve it. We have, he's going to, Alp, you're going to play a sound effect now? Yeah, sure. Uh, so we have invested in a mocap suit, a motion capture suit. Yeah, we've invested a motion capture suit, which will allow me to puppet any character I want live, live. So if I do that, I'll be able to brush my own hair. Um, the, the idea is that we genuinely believe there's a Web3 media company that we need to be specific to the culture in the world in which we operate. 
Now, if you've seen our shows, you know that we, we put a lot of effort into making them entertaining as much as possible. But what I started to see earlier in this year was PRP projects have communities of their own. They have a life of their own. But you can also take ownership of a single entity within those communities and bring it to life. And then when I started to see 3D versions of these characters, the lights went on for me and, and we have begun heavily investing in the technology that will allow us to do VTubing, uh, which will be virtual tubing. So I will be able to present this show as a board ape or as a sup duck, whatever I wanted to be, we could present from the moon if we wanted to, or from a from you know, from a space station. Whatever's correct for the story, we will be able to do. And that is where I think the production environment for the Defiant will go in the future. Um, not sure exactly when we're going to roll it out. We still need to get the suit, but it is happening and we are doing it and we are committed to doing it because it's the right way to tell these stories. So I'm excited about that. It'll still be me. I'll just be puppeting in real time a character in a suit and I'll have a phone strapped to my face like this and I'll be able to just do it in real time. Thank you, Unreal Engine. It wouldn't be possible without that. Insane. James Batten says, all the games on blockchain are nothing burgers. Only thing that's holding everything up is hopium to become rich. The entire space is built on greed. Everything else is noise to lessen the pain. Let's throw this one to Alp. Respond. That might be right, but also might be wrong. So depends on how you look at, look at it, you know? Could be right or could be wrong. Pick a lane, man. <laughs> I mean, it could be right. It could be wrong. Dude, I'm a diplomat. I, I go, I play both sides, you know? He's a diplomat. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Uh, all the games on blockchain are nothing burgers. Only the only thing that's holding everything up is hopium to become rich. It's not the only thing holding everything up. Uh, there's a lot of goodwill. There's some talent. There is some positivity and some engagement. You're not wrong, though. We had Joseph Rakic on the show yesterday. I asked him straight up, like, why are you in this space? Is that, yeah, for the money? Which I admired because a lot of people would have said, you know, I really believe in the future of blockchain for decentralizing human existence, you know, really pushing humanity forward. And he didn't say that. He said, yeah, I'm in it for the dollar, dollar bill, yo. And I get that. I understand that. Um, the thing is, the money brings all the girls to the yard. Damn right. Milkshake. Milkshake. I drink your milkshake, Eli. No, it does. Ah, Gazimov. I gave him a new toy this week and now he's abusing it. <laughs> the money brings people to the space. The money is exciting and earning money and making money gets people engaged. Like when everything turns to shit, as it inevitably does, you get like 5% of people who stick, stick around and really, you know, go deeper. Those are the people that make the difference. And, you know, those are the people that build things like terror. So it's not all greed. But a lot of it is greed. But without the greed, you wouldn't have the excitement and the development and these rushes of kind of, you know, uh, fervor and hype and everything else that bring eyeballs in. And without those eyeballs, we wouldn't have what we have now. It's just the nature of the cycle. But I would disagree that there is nothing being made because there are, there are some cool things. Uh, one of the kind of interesting projects I was looking at this week was Big Talk. Um, so there, it's Ari Malik from Decentraland uh, who has moved on to make a game. Uh, it's very, very exciting. But I'm, you know, I'm, I, I like everything. Like, it's great building a game. You put blockchain on top and it has to be the greatest thing in the world. No, make a great game. Make a great game. Easy said. Easy said. Very, very difficult to do. It's like making a great film. It's like, yeah, making a film is easy. No, 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 no. Filming stuff is quite easy. Making a great film, very, very difficult. Um, who's, who's, someone, someone, hey, how about, how cool the real world is? The virtual world is still horrible. The virtual world is not going to be as big as immersed reality, virtual in the real world. So it's, I guess you're talking about augmented reality. Augmented reality, yeah, that's probably the, the kind of the, the big, exciting piece of this. Um, allowing you to overlay stuff on the real world. I mean, basically all it needs is a, is a good interface for that. Like, do we want to have glasses on our faces that, that show us, you know, this is an NFT and you can buy it for X. 
it, yeah. I go into um, Somnium and and like Artura from Somnium was demoing a bunch of stuff at TEDx this week. And it is cool, but it's just, you know. This. This is not fun. That's not fun at all. It's sweaty. It's sweaty and it's hot and I don't like it. But, you know, hopefully they can improve that. Let's look at some other multi-user editing in Unreal and then you can have virtual guests. Uh, yeah, we, we I mean, to do this show, we have a, a little box that takes in streams H over HDMI into, you can see it here. Um, and then Alp has his stream deck there, which he's triggering stuff. Um, yes, that is, yeah, that's how we do things. I, I think it's not difficult to imagine that there can be multiple PCs plugged in and we could stream different things. What I, what I would ideally like to do is get Swanee, Simon One, in a suit as well, piloting another character remotely, and then we can interact with each other and that would be fun. You know, people have to just do this stuff and try this stuff and actually make it happen. And I think we are so well set up to be able to combine this love of DeFi with this love of NFTs with this love of the metaverse into a show that talks about this stuff, but talks about it in the language and in the manner in which it is meant to be experienced. So actually do it for real. That's fun. Uh, what else do we have? By the way, sorry to break it, but this metaverse thing is the ultimate evil plan. And that's where we will see the Armageddon. This is basically creating God's work on earth. Well, you know, that definition of an avatar is a god it's an actual god so yes um i think it's yeah the ultimate evil plan is it that that kind of suggests that there's an architect to all of this um bill gates injected his vaccine into my into my nutsack and and now we are under the control of the evil overlords the martians are coming i don't know all I know is that when I ask Alp to do stuff, most of the time he does it. Yes. I do it. He says it, I do it. VR chat is already a thing. We're still, we're already here. Yeah, VR chat is amazing. I, I hate it, to be honest with you, because you always end up talking to some random, like, teenager who goes, can I help you? Can I do something? Can I do something? Can I do something? It's like, fuck off. <laughs> I am 44 years old. I don't need to talk to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's like, go away. The VR chat is awesome. Uh, I'm very curious what my kids are going to do, what what platform they're going to use, what what they're going to, you know, like at school, they all have Chromebooks. And they all, like, what are your kids doing, Alp? Just, uh, yeah, um, my kids are old, man. They're like 30 already. Yeah. They, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, James Batham says, tell Ivan to mint the lobsters. Uh, yes. Lobster Dow is releasing lobster NFTs. If you were active in the Lobster Dow for the last two years, you'll be due an NFT. If you weren't active in the Lobster Dow, you get nothing. <laughs> Except if you own a board ape or a punk, in which case you might be eligible one if you're quick. Lobster Dow. Shout out, Ivan. Boo! Watch Matrix with his mindset. You shall see, my friends. Ooh. Yes. Um, it is, yeah. It's very, very, e oh, wow. Snoop Dogg hit $17.6 million in NFT assets. Yeah, Snoop in this space. Is he Cosmo Medici? What do you think, Alp? Is Snoop Cosmo Medici? I don't think so. Who no. cares anyway? Yeah. Who cares? He's just trolling. Snoop is Snoop. He's a storyteller, the gangster. He's a G. The lot master. What's so amazing about Snoop is that there's no logical reason why he should still be popular and yet he is because his style of music went out of fashion like 20 years ago and he never really evolved but like he's just famous for smoking weed and having someone who's, who rolls blunts for him you know that's that's sort of the vibe here I but he's like. cool is it, i mean it, you know, he's cool but it's <laughs> I, don't, I don't know is that <laughs> is that the best is that the best kind of advertisement for, for the sandbox i don't know i don't know probably I'm, I'm very curious to see what's going to happen with Wilder World because that is uh, Logan Paul connected in some way and he seems to have his finger on the pulse. But you've got the likes of FaZe, uh, FaZe Banks, connected to this space. FaZe has been buying NFTs like they've been going out of fashion. 
I wonder if these those guys understand what the metaverse is. That's Snoop, by the way. Snoop partnered with Martha Stewart. He is Cosmo. The sandbox party pass NFTs weren't minted to Cosmo's wallet. Okay. Fair enough. He is real. What do you think is going to happen, Ari, the dumb high ETH gas prices? Okay. Well, let's look at Bitcoin. I'm not sure we can bring Bitcoin up right now, but Bitcoin was traditionally heavily congested and unusable and very, very expensive. Actually, Bitcoin is quite usable now um, because nobody's using it anymore because it's too expensive. Uh, with ETH, it's very, very simple. There are layer two scaling solutions like Arbitrum, like Optimism, like Polygon. Those will take some of the load. If people want to stay on Ethereum, they will. And they will pay the price of being on Ethereum for one simple reason. It's because the most dApps are there and the most users are there. The volume is there. It's on the other platforms to create a compelling proposition. I don't think Solana on its own can do it. I don't think Cardano on its own can do it. I don't think Avalanche on its own can do it. However, when you see Solana, Polkadot, Cosmos, and all of those chains coming together to form a block of interoperable blockchains, well, then I think they can do it. So, you know, we're in a competitive environment. But yeah, I say it's a competitive environment, but it's not. Because the whole point about metaverses and value transfer is that it can go wherever it wants to go without borders, without friction. So once they figure out the piping and that you can scoot around wherever you want to go, that won't matter anymore. Gin and juice. Indogo is Snoop's gin. Yeah, I've not had um, Indogo. Entering the singularity is basically when they switch your lights off with a lethal injection and pretend you live forever in the ether. How many films have we seen in which people believe they're living in the real world, but they're actually living in a simulation? Elon Musk believes we're living in a simulation. What do you think, Gazimov? You're an ethical economist. Yeah. Even if we know we live in a simulation, how do we know it actually, you know? How do we know that we live in a simulation? Uh, because we can intuit it. We can what? We can intuit it. How? Can you demonstrate in intuit it? <clears throat> if, we can, if we can imagine it, if we can believe it's possible, then it is possible. Yeah. So... And it's built on Unreal Engine. Big up yourself. <laughs> Big up yourself, Fortnite. <laughs> <laughs> real real time ray tracing lumen big fam yes we know we are in a simulation because we dream says inner standing Ooh, yeah what about a drop of acid i don't know <laughs> don't do drugs kids don't do it listen i think it's time we wrap this up i wish we could have played the damn videos the travis scott concert is amazing in fortnite it's incredible i I've never seen anything like it. The music's fat. The experience is fat. The visuals are fat. You see this massive Travis Scott just racing around. I wish I had been there. Um, so I want to big, give a big shout. What are you doing? Gazimov. Entertainment, man. Entertainment. It's Friday afternoon. We're having a beer. I hope you're having a beer as well and enjoying this. <sighs> <laughs> and we're back if you want to see what it looks like when a man gets fired live on youtube this is the moment no it's uh i want to give a big shout out to the people that made this presentation possible um Piers kicks and uh i forgot the other guy's name <laughs> <laughs> it's been so long <laughs> but uh yeah no there's um there's a ton of useful information out there but i think the biggest takeaway from all of this is the metaverse is not a place it's a lair it is there for everybody and i don't think we should just think of sandbox and everything else as the solution to that there's simply instances of entertainment built on top of a metaverse experience but we're not there yet uh, however when i see things like the travis scott concert uh it does make you think wow there is so much as creators that we can do there. And I guess the big takeaway for you guys is the Defiant is going virtual and we will be doing stuff that nobody else is doing 
and we're going to be doing it pretty damn soon. So pay attention to that. And of course, as always, like, subscribe. Look for that. There it is. Yeah, if you'd like to see more content like this, we'll be doing a ton more. But this was live week on The Defiant. We read a book on the internet. How dope is that? I will see you on the next one. Thank you so much for tuning in. You've been great. Thank you for all the great comments. Thank you for all the great questions. We didn't answer them all. That's a shame, but we will in the future. Please get in touch with Jules Zerbach from Otoy. Oh, yeah, we're doing it. We're doing it. Peace out. Thanks.